Welcome, happy Friday. Hope your day is going well and your weekend is even better. Uh, today, for those of you in section 01, uh, we'll meet at 1.10 p.m. 2501. You'll turn in the chromatography lab. Problem set number one, we'll talk about before you turn it in. Quiz number one, we'll be over the stuff from problem set one. And then we'll start the Lewis structures in class lab, which is again, just a lab to kind of give us more experience doing Lewis structures, Vesper geometry, stuff like that. Any question? So uh, on Wednesday, we started talking about one of the two theories that scientists uh, use to explain why things bond as they do. And the two theories uh, are called valence bond theory, which is also sometimes known as hybridization theory, same thing. And the other one is molecular orbital theory. And right now we're looking at why, how uh, valence bond theory works. <clears throat> and the question in both MO and this valence bond theory is how do you go from S orbitals and P orbitals, which we saw at the end of Chem 221, and the S orbitals were just big spheres and the P orbitals were kind of like figure eights. How do you go from those into tetrahedrons? Now, tetrahedrons, like we've been talking about, have an angle of roughly 109 degrees. So how do you go from, at best, 90 degree angles into these unusual directions? And that's what hybridization and valence bond theory uh, is all about. Valence orbitals of carbon are the 2s orbital and the 3 2p orbitals. When these atoms form methane, their orbitals are thought to hybridize to form four equivalent orbitals. Because each hybrid orbital for the carbon atom is composed of one part s orbital and three parts p orbital, they are called sp3 orbitals. The energies of the hybrid orbitals are the average of the original atomic orbitals. This is an important video and I'm gonna show it one more time. Um, this shows how hybridization explains the formation of a tetrahedral carbon in methane. And methane is CH4. We're gonna talk a lot about methane here coming up. Um, the rationalization is, is that initially, if you remember from Chem 221, and if you don't, it's all right. The 2s was a little lower energy and the three 2ps were a little higher energy. And when you make a molecule, those three 2p orbitals, x, y, and z, and the 2s, they mix, all right? And mixing in this context means hybrid, hybridize, all right? They become a hybrid of the previous ones. Now, uh, 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 protection of energy, can't create or destroy any energy, is super important in all these physical scientists, science programs. So we're not making or destroying any energy. The three higher orbitals come down in energy and the one lower orbital goes up. So you end up with four, what they call degenerate orbitals and degenerate in this context just means they're all the same energy. Now before in carbon, you had a 2s2, 2p2. And those four electrons then each take one orbital because we've seen how by Hund's rule, the electrons like to be in their own orbitals if at all possible. There's a little bit lower energy that way. So hybrid orbitals form. And because they form from three 2p orbitals and one 2s orbital, that's where this weird sp3, it's like three p's and one s orbital. These are the four sp3 orbitals. And as we as chemists talk about the hybridization of these atoms, it's always the central atom. So we would say that this carbon is sp3 hybridized. It's no longer 2s2, 2p2, it's now sp3. So each one of these little teardrop looking things is one electron, all right? And the, hybrid, the hydrogens come in, they smack into those, each of those sp3 orbitals to make a sigma bond. So in this context, the central atom undergoes this mixing, this hybridization. It's not the hydrogens, not the outside atoms, it's the inside atoms. And also as a punchline, Anytime you see tetrahedral electron pair geometry, we're going to refer to it as sp3 hybridized. So I'm going to show that video again because it's pretty important. The valence orbitals of carbon are the 2s orbital and the 3 2p orbitals. 
when these atoms form methane, their orbitals are thought to hybridize to form four equivalent orbitals. Because each hybrid orbital for the carbon atom is composed of one part s orbital and three parts p orbital, they are called sp3 orbitals. The energies of the hybrid orbitals are the average of the original atomic orbitals. So when a hybridization scientist talks about carbon in methane, CH4, they would describe it as an sp3 hybridized system. All right. That's kind of the punchline of how this thing works. A methane molecule forms when four hydrogen atoms form sigma bonds to the sp3 hybrid orbitals of the carbon atom. So this then shows the carbon-hydrogen bonds that occur. And initially, it showed the four sp3 hybrid orbitals and their tetrahedral positions. This little circle thing, that's the 1s1 of a hydrogen, all right? S's are always just big spheres. And the connection between them, which is this part right here, the sigma bond, occurs when one of the sp3 orbitals mixes with one of the 1s orbitals. So that's what it's called. <clears throat> so this little picture right here is a little bit better of a teardrop picture. It's really got a little bit of a node on the other side. We don't need to worry about that. This part and this is the same. And they're all equally distant from each other because the electrons don't want to be close. They make a nice tetrahedron to have maximum distance from each other. And then the hydrogens come into the outside, make the sigma bonds. You've got the molecule. This is another picture that shows all this. This is the unhybridized carbon. So this would be like elemental carbon, all right? It's got a 2s2, 2p2. Here's the orbital box diagrams we looked at in Chem 221. And what happens when you make a molecule with carbon, that carbon hybridizes. And again, all hybridization means is that these orbitals and these orbitals mix. So you don't have higher and lower, you've got four orbitals, all with the same energy. And these are the sp3 orbitals. And if they're all the same energy, they want to stay as far apart from each other as they can. That's where the tetrahedron comes from. And then those sp3s, which are these brown ones, mix with the 1s orbitals of hydrogens to make CH4. Now, I just said a lot of words. A lot of words which may sound like the peanuts thing. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> All right. So the punchline of hybridization theory is you can describe the hybridization looking exclusively at the electron pair geometry. So every system that you've seen so far and you will see that's tetrahedral, we will describe as sp3 hybridized. And every system we've seen that's a linear electron pair geometry, we can describe as sp. There's also some other ones down here with d orbitals. The trigonal bipyramid is sp3d. The octahedral is sp3d2. And by the way, these used to be referred to more as dsp3 and d2sp3. I've tried to fix my notes, but it may still slip in once in a while. It is the same thing. Um, I'm an inorganic chemist. I love the d orbitals, I'll be honest, transition metals. However, uh, the trend is to put the d's at the end. Fascist. Anyway, this Vesper guide just is essentially listing these things. But again, the punchline is that electron pair geometry will tell you what hybridization so I'll say, what's the hybridization of the sulfur and sulfur dioxide? Well, look at the electron pair geometry. Draw the Lewis structure. Tack on one of these hybridization terms right here. Good to go. So the actual use of hybridization is pretty easy. Electron pair geometry equals the hybridization term. You can see, hopefully, that scientists are trying to rationalize, like, why you see trigonal planar and sp3 and stuff. Now, we're going to talk about the use of the p orbitals out here. There's some unused p orbitals. We saw one for boron uh, on Wednesday when we looked at, I think it was BF3 or something like that. Um, there's a use for these, and we'll see this here in just a second. But any questions? Sweet. So this is the kind of question you might see, and it says, what hybrid orbital set is used by the nitrogen atom in ammonia, NH3? And it gives you the five different choices. 
So if you see a problem like this, what's the first thing you've got to do? Draw. Draw the Lewis structure. Absolutely. That's the name of the game, these first couple of chapters. Uh, I'm going to let you do this on your own, but when you do it, we saw an example of it uh, last week. Ammonia has one lone pair on the nitrogen and three bonds, single bonds, to hydrogen. So what is the electron pair geometry around the nitrogen in ammonia? Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. And anytime you have tetrahedral, sp3 hybridized. Okay. Questions? Here's just some more examples of different kinds of molecules. Um, this is beryllium dichloride, which people think is actually covalent, although I'm a little suspicious, but that's okay. Anyway, the Lewis structure has a beryllium in the middle of the chlorines. Linear electron pair geometry, this would be sp hybridized. Excuse me. We saw, I think, BF3 on Wednesday. It's a trigonal planar electron pair geometry, sp2 carbon in anything tetrahedral, sp3, etc, etc. So if I said, what's the hybridization of these atoms in glycine, all right? A couple of things. First of all, hybridization is specific to central atoms, and a molecule might have more than one central atom, all right? And that'll be important in our lab today, too. Um, glycine is a more complex molecule, and you can see there's lots and lots of possible central atoms. Now, each of these will have its own hybridization and its own electron pair geometry slash molecular geometry. So let's collectively start right here at this nitrogen, and we'll kind of go uh, clockwise over to this oxygen. So this one right here, of course, is looking at this nitrogen. What's the electron pair geometry around that nitrogen? Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral, that's right. And nitrogen has one, two, three bonds and a lone pair, just like this nitrogen had four bonds and stuff around it. And anytime you have tetrahedral, what's the hybridization? SP3. SP3, nice job. SP3 just means you got those four bonds. They want to be as far apart from each other as they can. Question? Okay, let's keep going. This carbon right here, all right, the carbon had in the middle uh, one, two, three, four single bonds around it. What's the electron pair geometry of that carbon? Tetra. Tetrahedral, that's right. And tetrahedral is always sp3. SP3. Cool. Now, I want someone other than Clifford to say it. Clifford, you're the man. I appreciate it, but I want someone else to do it now. Now, this carbon is a little bit different, all right? This carbon has a single bond here, a single bond here, and a double bond right there, all right? In my world, that's a three-cloud system. You have a question, John? No, no. Oh, it's okay. You can answer. You know, I would say that it would be trigonal, right? Trigonal planar. That's right. Well done, John. Nice job. I appreciate you stepping up, man. This one's different. Different electron pair geometry. All right. The others have all been tetrahedral. Trigonal planar. Does anybody remember what hybridization term is used with trigonal planar? SP2. Outstanding. Thank you, Clifford. You're back on, man. I appreciate you. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> so this oxygen right here, two lone pairs, two single bonds. What's the EPG around it? Tetra. Tetra, thanks. Anytime you have tetrahedral, it's SP3. Questions on that? Is that cool? I think hybridization is pretty chill to add on. All right, you draw the Lewis structure, you find the electron pair geometry. This is like one more piece of information. You can also, of course, find the molecular geometry, the bond angles, blah, blah, blah. This is like just one more piece of thing that chemists can use to figure out what's going on. Now, the other thing that's really interesting, though, is there were those unused p orbitals, and there's a use for them. Now, earlier in that one example, uh, there was a carbon-oxygen double bond and two singles. And if you have a double bond and two singles, double bonds and triple bonds count as one cloud. And at first that seems a little weird. Like you think, well, a double bond would be two clouds, three, four, tetrahedral, but that's not what we see. 
So to understand why double and triple bonds, for that matter, are one big cloud, we're going to look a little bit more at these double bonds. Now this compound right here is called ethylene. That's the common name, like water. The official name is ethene. We'll see that here coming up too. Just like water is dihydrogen monoxide officially, but only nerdy chemists use that. All right, almost everybody calls this ethylene, but really it's ethane. Anyway, because of this trigonal planar, which is 120 degrees, this is actually a flat molecule, all right? Because this carbon-carbon double bond uh, has two trigonal planars, and it's completely flat. So the question is, why is it flat? Why isn't there something above and below, like a molecule or something? Sigma bonds in ethylene come from the overlap of sp2 hybrid orbitals, one from each carbon atom. When you look at a molecule like ethylene or ethene, all right, there's sigma bonds, and those are the single bonds. Now, as a quick review from something we saw in chapter seven, a double bond, the first line you draw is a sigma bond, and the second line you draw is what we call a pi bond, all right? So in this little picture right here, we're looking at the sigma bonds, those single bonds that are between the different pieces. So carbon, hydrogen, this carbon here is a trigonal planar, it's sp2 hybridized. So you've got three of these kind of teardrop looking things on the carbon. Hydrogen just is good old 1s1 kind of thing, so they smack together. This part right here, this interaction is what makes the sigma bond a sigma bond, all right? And you can see those there. Now, two sp2 hybrid orbitals can also come together, smack into each other, and make a sigma bond. And again, that's this part right here. So this is like a fancier version of all the single bonds in this molecule. But I haven't talked about where the pi bond comes from. And that's a pretty cool application of hybridization theory. So the pi bond is because of that unused p orbital. Now carbon, if you remember, 1s2, core electrons, boring, they don't do anything. 2s2, 2p2. If you hybridize carbon to something like we have in ethylene, you end up with sp2. Those are the three teardrop molecule looking orbital things we saw in the last picture. But because there's one, two, three, four orbitals, what 2s and 3, 2p, that means there's one unused t, 2p orbital. And carbon has a total of four electrons. So three of them make the sigma bonds, which I showed in the last picture, but there's one more orbital there with a single electron on it, all right? So each of those carbons, each of those carbons right there has one p orbital, which hasn't been accounted for yet. And that's what makes the pi bond. And pi bonds are really fascinating. Pi bonds, the best way to describe them in my world is you can think about them like a piece of bread in a sandwich, and we'll talk about that. Now, this ugly picture, which is totally useless, basically, um, if you look, there's three golden globes, and those are the sp2, like, teardrop things, all right? But there's one more orbital, and the p's, if you remember, are kind of like a figure eight. This is the part of the p that sticks out, and this is part of the p that sticks out. But notice it's above and below the carbon's sp2 network, this part right here. So above and below means it's going to have its own special kind of bond. The pi bonds arise from the overlap of unhybridized p orbitals, one on each carbon. Note that pi bonding electrons are found in a region above and below the sigma bonding region. When you make a pi bond, right, not the sigma bonds, but a pi bond, those two p orbitals, which stick up a little above and a little below, they talk to each other. There's electron interaction. So just like sigmas are head-to-head -head overlap, kind of smashing together, the two p's, they communicate above and below. So one thing that I use to try and talk about these crazy p orbitals is through the idea of a sandwich, all right? 
Uh, Clifford, I need your help, man. Yes. Uh, Clifford's going to be the quote unquote meat of my sandwich. Now, I'm a vegetarian, so I'm going to eat vegetables, but that's okay. You just have whatever meat substitute you want. So, Clifford here is like a Subway veggie delight, all the vegetables that go in the middle. Mm. But you can't just hold on to the veggies, they crumble in your hand. You need the bread. So, a bread goes above and below the veggies in the veggie sandwich. My hands is that's a pi bond, all right? It's both above and below the sigma network, which is what Clifford represents. So we've been talking about sigma bonds a lot, single bonds. I've been shaking Clifford's hand, he's sick of me shaking it. Well, now this is a new kind of a bond. It's like a bread that goes above and below the sigma bond. Yeah. So you can see in this little picture, I'll show it again, it's like there's a piece of bread above and below the place where those sigma bonds go. And that's what makes the pi bond. That's why this molecule is flat. You've got these invisible electrons in the pi bond doing it. A pi bond like I said, is both above and below. Both of those pieces is that second line you draw when you make a double bond. I'll show it one more time because it's kind of cool. The pi bonds arise from the overlap of unhybridized p orbitals, one on each carbon. Note that pi bonding electrons are found in a region above and below the sigma bonding region. So again, these two little lobes, uh, that's the pi bond, the sandwich. The, it's not the sigma bond. The sigma bond is what Clifford's hand was. That's the part where the teardrops kind of smash together on each other. So a pi bond is literally above and below the sigma network. When we look at both sigma and pi bonds, we see that the CH2 fragments are coplanar and the ethylene is a flat molecule. So in this diagram, the part in the middle there, that's Clifford's hand, <laughs> all right? Clifford was the sigma network between the two carbons. And my hands were both above and below Clifford's. It's that bread, <laughs> all right? That's why I can tell I get hungry. I should have had breakfast this morning, whatever. Anyway, that's what a pi bond is. It's a weird kind of interaction. It's a lot different than just our head-to-head -head overlap that we've been talking about so far. Um, this shows a little bit better maybe the bread, all right? This, and again, both of these pieces are the pi bond. It's like two pieces per bond. And this shows the sigma bond. So again, this would be Clifford. This would be my hands. And together, this part right here in the middle is what I was trying to represent. So pi bonds usually are flat. All right, they usually have a big area there because, and they're not because they're nothing there. The electrons are there and they're essentially keeping the other pieces off. Oh, but there's more. Chi, the other day you said you wanted to help out. You want to help? All right, cool. You got to come down. And Clifford, I have to have you stand up now. Okay. A triple bond has to come over here. A triple bond is really a trip. <laughs> All right. So, Clifford, you're going to be the sigma once again. Chi, oh, actually, Chi, you're going to use your hands and go above and below. All right. So, yeah, just like that. All right. Now, this is what I was doing with Clifford just a while ago. This would be a double bond. A triple bond is 90 degrees from cheese hands. So it's like a super sandwich. Woohoo! <laughs> and it's like to the left and the right while she is above and below. They're so high to break. Triple bonds, bond order goes up, bond energy goes up. You nailed it. Thank you, both of you, yeah. for being my super sandwich, all right? So, yeah, the, the, yeah, right, I, I really should have had pregnant. Anyway, <laughs> brought that back on. So a single bond is like, again, just an interaction sigma network smacking head to head. That was Clifford. One pi bond was chi. That's when chi had above and below the sandwich, if you will, all right? But you can have triple bonds. Triple bonds is a second set of pi bonds. So if chi was above and below, I I was trying to be left and right, all right? And all three of these bonds is what makes the triple bond. It's totally crazy, man. But anyway, uh, C2H2, acetylene, aka ethyne, we'll talk about that next chapter, is an example of a triple bond. <clears throat> and in this weird picture, here's, uh, we'll say this is cheese uh, hands trying to be the one set of bread. This is my set of hands, again, 90 degrees. So this is up and down. This is left and right. This is uh, Clifford right here in the middle, the sigma network 
coming together. But she really brought it home because you have one, two, three types of bonds. It does take a lot more energy to break these up, all right? Like, you know, breaking up a single shake with Clifford was bad and doubles are crazy. Well, triples would be even higher energy. So, yeah, I loved your comment. Getting too excited here, I know. Any questions? <laughs> questions on any of this? All right. So, uh, the question here is how many total sigma and pi bonds do you have in a set C2H2? Now, I want to redraw. Colleagues are playing the eraser, but that's beside the point. I'm going to redraw the settling up here. So settling, when we draw it, is this one right here, all right? C2H2 to make all the things have octets, hydrogen one, blah, blah, blah. Now, what happens a lot of times on a molecule like this, and that's why we're bringing it up, is people focus big time on the triple bond. And to be honest, that's the exciting part. That's where the energy of settling torches come from. Well, this is one sigma right here and two pi bonds. And so people think, oh yeah, one sigma, two pi bonds, this one right here. Oh, don't forget the carbon hydrogens, all right? Now, what kind of bond do you have between the carbons and the hydrogens? Sigma. Sigma, right on. So this molecule has one, two, three sigmas and two pi bonds in it. Don't forget the carbon hydrogens. That's kind of the punch lines of this one right here. So there's a total of one, two, three sigmas, one, two pi bonds, five bonds total. Any questions? Now, uh, one thing that you'll see, and we'll talk about a little bit today in um, our lab, is there's a, big con there's a big reason why double bonds and triple bonds are important to chemists. A single bond in solution rotates like crazy, all right? It's like a propeller. As long as you're above absolute zero, these are like two CH3 groups. And think about this CH3 relative to this one. It literally goes around like a propeller, all right? If you're above absolute zero, which is hopefully all of us at this point, um, yeah, it just goes around like crazy. But a double bond, you have to break that pi bond to make it flip around. And that has a big, uh, re a big uh, issue when it comes to making isomers of compounds. <clears throat> so a single bond will rotate around like crazy, but a double bond will not. Carbon-carbon double bond prevents the ends of the two butene molecule from rotating freely relative to each other. As one end rotates, the energy of the molecule increases greatly because the carbon-carbon pi bond must be effectively broken. That is, there is a large energy barrier to rotation around the carbon-carbon double bond. Butane can rotate easily about its carbon-carbon single bond because the atoms of its methyl groups repel each other rather weakly. Rotation about this bond is accompanied by a small energy barrier and occurs readily at room temperature. The two sides of the molecule are therefore constantly spinning with respect to each other. Both of these are four carbon organic uh, molecules, and we'll talk more about this in the next section. The difference between these is this one has a double bond, and this one is all single bonds. Now, don't worry about this little weird diagram. Think of this as just a big up and a down. You'll talk about this in organic chemistry if you take that class, but not in this class. The difference I want you to see right here is that this is about 80 and this is about 20. So 80 minus 20, about 60, all right? 230 minus about 30, 200. So the difference in these y-axes are is pretty substantial, all right? And that shows chemists. <clears throat> it takes a lot more energy to make a CH3 down here turn into a CH3 up there. It's about 200 kilojoules per mole, which is a, a lot of energy, all right? On the other hand, making this CH3 go to a CH3 up here, roughly 60 kilojoules, all right? And that's a lot more accessible of a value than the 200 one. Um, notice this trans term. If you uh, remember hearing about trans fats and how the 
are bad for you and stuff like that. This is the trans form of this molecule. Trans, we're going to see in the next chapter, means you have some groups that are the same on opposite carbons, but one is up and one is down. Cis, which we'll talk about next quarter, is when this CH3 is here and the hydrogen's down there. So going from the trans right now to the cis, which is where that little gap is right there, a lot of energy, about 200 kilojoules, not an easy amount. This one doesn't have cool names to it because we don't see it, all right, unless you're very close to absolute zero when it comes to difference. So, questions? Okay, so. Everything we've seen so far has been about hybridization theory, aka valence bond theory. And valence bond slash hybridization theory is wonderful if eight and I uh, are meeting at Starbucks, <laughs> all right? And he goes, oh, Russell, what's the hybridization? What's, what's going on with this carbon atom? Well, if I look at the electron pair geometry, I can say sp3 or dsp3 or whatever, all right? So hybridization is great for what scientists call back of the envelope calculations, which means you don't have to pull out your phone or your sophisticated quantum computer to do any kind of calculations on it. But hybridization is limited, all right? It's a pretty mellow kind of thing. So now we're gonna look at the bigger brother of hybridization, and it's called molecular orbital theory. Now, MO theory is a much more comprehensive and honestly accurate theory to use. Um, molecular orbital theory will account for the paramagnetism of things. It can be used for color. It does a great job for bonding, stuff like that. <clears throat> um, in a molecular orbital diagram, like this one right here, they will usually have atomic orbitals on the left and the right. So this is an example of a lithium. Lithium has three electrons, 1s2, 2s1. So this is lithium atom number one, and this is a second lithium atom, lithium atom number two. It's also 1s2, 2s1. And those atomic orbitals on the left and the right become molecular orbitals in the middle. So this part in the middle, the blue boxes, that's the action of the MO theory, <laughs> all right? And molecular orbital theory, pretty powerful. <clears throat> now, in a molecular orbital diagram, you'll have different kinds of orbitals. <clears throat> Relative to the atomic orbitals, if you have an orbital which is lower energy, it's called a bonding molecular orbital. If an orbital is higher than the atomic orbitals it came from, it's called an anti-bonding orbital. And we won't see it in this class, but sometimes you end up with orbitals that are the same energy, and those are called non-bonding. So it's a little bit different, like I said, than uh, the other kinds of things do. Now, <clears throat> The MO theory is pretty sophisticated. Just like we saw that making 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, you needed like uh, math uh, calculus four kind of stuff. Uh, molecular orbital takes those kind of things and makes molecules, which is not a small feat. So it's very, very complicated. Uh, making uh, like even like this molecule right here, C2H2, uh, is pretty, pretty hardcore, all right? So in Chem 222, I really want you to get a taste of it, all right? We're not gonna go super deep into it because honestly, you need computers and you need uh, approximation techniques, a lot of stuff. <clears throat> we will only be looking at diatomics, like this one, two atom systems, all right, coming together. So this has four atoms, uh, that's more than we can do, unfortunately. And also, because MO is so theory, we're only going to look at diatomics up to the end of the second period. Now, we talked a lot about periods, and so we saw that second period can only make things up to tetrahedral, third period more can go higher. In MO theory, in our class, we're only going to look up to molecules that have neon in them. So we won't look at chlorine and sodium and stuff like that. And I'll talk about, like, why we um, very well. This particular MO diagram is pretty cool to me, all right? So as you know or may not know, if you're new to my world, which is okay, I'm really into Star Trek, woo -hoo! And Star Trek, to make their enterprise go to warp drive, they needed 
dilithium. Dilithium is real. Now, it's not like the dilithium of Star Trek. Darn it, at least they haven't figured out how to make it like the dilithium of Star Trek, but it is a molecule that exists. It can be made. This diagram right here, after we get to learn how this works, shows that dilithium is real. So, you know, live long and prosper. You don't have to like Star Trek to get an A in this class. However, that's why I'm showing it. Questions? Prof that also off. I'm hoping that maybe one day in a class like this, you'll have the TI-2000 calculator and you'll put in molecular orbital diagram of C2H2 and out will pop out all the things, all right? And people's like, well, come on. But they, a long time ago, the solve button was thought impossible. So I'm hoping that one day you're all gonna have the TI-2000. But anyway, Prof that back on hasn't happened yet. Yeah, Alex. So that picture, if it was written out, like how this C H's, it would just be Li2? Yes, that's right, that's right. And it's the middle part, Alex, which is the Li2. The left is a lithium atom, the right is a lithium atom, and the Li2 is this part in the middle. And we'll learn how to interpret this kind of stuff in this section. Good. All right. Hydrogen is not magnetic. It is diamagnetic. All the electrons in the molecule are paired. Oxygen, however, interacts with a magnetic field because it is paramagnetic. This physical property indicates that molecular oxygen has unpaired electrons. Molecular orbital theory accounts for this fact, but valence bond theory does not. Star Trek sucks, Dr. Russell. Oh, you get out of my class. Okay, Richard. No, I'm just joking. Seriously, maybe you need a better reason than Star Trek to rationalize why MO theory is cool. So let me try and give one. I'm going to draw up here Lewis structures for nitrogen, N2, and oxygen, O2. Like that. All right. Now, uh, in chapter seven, we looked at nitrite. And nitrite, which I'll also put up here, was an example of a paramagnetic Lewis structure. Nitrite had a lone electron on there, double bonds can resonate, blah, blah, blah. But nitrite was an example of a paramagnetic structure. Now, in Chem 221, if you took it here, whenever you took it, paramagnetic things are attracted to magnetic fields. All right, they might be attracted, they might be repulsed. Does N2, right here, from the Lewis structure, look like a paramagnetic or a diamagnetic molecule? Diamagnetic, that's right. There are no lone electrons on N2, all right? This is a lone pair, this is a bonding pair. So N2, when you put it through a magnetic field, we would expect it to just go on through. It's diamagnetic. And in this video, that's what we saw. The liquid nitrogen goes right on through the magnet, no big deal. Does O2 look like it's paramagnetic or diamagnetic? Diamagnetic, that's right. Again, two lone pairs, two lone pairs, two bonding pairs, no odd electrons. So the Lewis structure for O2 looks diamagnetic, but in reality, Liquid oxygen is paramagnetic. It was sticking, if you will, to the magnetic field. So some of our Lewis structures honestly aren't quite right. right? I'm trying to hold this back because we're doing so much with Lewis structures. And again, most of the time Lewis structures are awesome, but there's a couple of them like O2. Mm, it's technically paramagnetic. Our molecular orbital theory analysis will show why oxygen is paramagnetic and not diamagnetic. Again, this is a limitation of the Lewis structure Vesper theory. It's not doing a very good job, but MO will knock this out of the ballpark. And MO does this a lot, all right? It's a better theory, but you need usually the TI-2000 or the equivalent calculator to have it done. So that's why we're gonna go through some examples, see how cool it is. All right, there's four principles of molecular orbital theory that will help you out a lot. The first one, pretty simple. Remember, chemistry is all about conservation of energies, blah, blah, blah. 
If you have four atomic orbitals going into a molecule, you're going to end up with four molecular orbitals. You're not going to create or destroy any orbitals going from the atomic orbitals on the outside, the left and right, to the inside, the molecular orbitals. All right? This is conservation of orbitals, blah, blah, blah. So if you have two 1s orbitals, one on each hydrogen, and you want to make the molecule H2, you're going to end up with two molecular orbitals. On the other hand, like we saw for dilithium, we had two 1s and two 2s. Lithium is 1s, two 2s, one, two types of atomic orbitals. And because there's two lithiums, two plus two, four atomic orbitals are going to make four molecular orbitals. Okay, so here's an example. We have two oxygen atoms coming together, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. And the question is, how many total molecular orbitals would you predict? So how many atomic orbitals in the 1s part here? Two. Two. Uh, okay, the two right there is the number of electrons. And remember how electrons can be both spin up and spin down? So it's one. That's right, yeah. 1s is one orbital, all right? It's one orbital with a spin up and a spin down. That's why there's two. There's two electrons per orbital, all right? So this is one atomic orbital. This is one atomic orbital. 2s is like 1s. But how many atomic orbitals in the 2p? Three. There we go, Claire. Yeah, right on. There's an X, a Y, and a Z. So remember that two P's can hold up to six electrons, like neon. All right, so this actually represents then one, two, three. In Chem 221, uh, we would have put 1s, 2s, 2p, like that. Each one of those lines, which is sometimes seen as a box, is an orbital. All right. So there's one, two, three, four, five atomic orbitals per oxygen atom. So if we're gonna make O2 a molecule, how many total molecular orbitals would you expect? Yeah, also five. Yeah, five is from the other one, so five times two, there would be 10 molecular orbitals total, all right? The examples we're gonna see in Chem 222 will have up to 10 molecular orbitals, all right? We won't go past neon, which would be a 2p6, all right? So the maximum amount we're gonna see would be 10. You can imagine, though, as the orbitals get bigger, we start getting to chlorine or iodine. Ooh, then you start having a lot more orbitals, but no problem. Uh, questions on that? Wait, so it's originally five atomic orbitals, and then we get to molecular. Is it kind of like it's 10 because, um, what is it what happened with the hybridization or? Cool. So uh, all of these, like this is one oxygen atom, Clifford, all right? And you have a second oxygen atom, all right? And this is just a blueprint of the first one, all right? So one, two, three, four, five for this one. One, two, three, four, five for this one. Five plus five. Oh, good, yeah. No, 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 that's a good question. I'm glad you asked, so yeah. Other question? Bonding molecular orbitals has greater electron density in the bond region. The anti-bonding molecular orbital has reduced electron density in the inner nuclear region. When two orbital atomic orbitals come together, they're gonna make two molecular orbitals. But because scientists, and physical science anyway, um, follow the law of conservation of energy, you can't create or destroy any, any energy. So when the two atomic orbitals come together, one of them is going to be lower energy, and one of them is going to be higher energy. Now the lower energy is where the bonding occurs, because if you can make a molecule with lots of bonding, then hey, that's going to be better than the atoms they came from. On the other hand, the anti-bonding tends to make the molecule less stable. It's not very happy. So this shows the two combinations that are possible with 1s. When you make a bonding molecular orbital, these two get closer, all right? The blue is just electrons flowing together. Everybody's happy, kumbaya, whatever. This is a bonding molecular orbital, all right? The molecule wants to form if you've got lots of these around. 
On the other hand, the anti-bonding is higher energy, and there is a gap, a node. We talked about nodes in Chem 221, the place where there's no electron density. There's actually no glue holding these together. So this one will stabilize the molecule, this one will destabilize the molecule. So scientists will use a little star to represent the anti-bonding version. A sigma by itself would be a bonding, and a sigma star would be an anti-bonding. So those two atomic orbitals come together, they make two molecular orbitals, one goes up and one goes down, same amount of energy. The down one is the bonding one that makes it stronger, the higher one is the anti-bonding which makes it weaker. So the bonding molecular orbital is lower in energy, the anti-bonding is higher in energy. And you have to have both, all right? You can't have, just get rid of the anti-bonding or something like that. This is the law of conservation of energy. Now, in, when you're assigning electrons, just like we saw with, the top, with atoms, you always go to the lowest orbitals and go up to the highest orbitals. So we saw in Chem 221 that we always filled in the 1s first, and then the 2s, and then the 2p, and the 3s. Well, we're gonna do the same thing here, but it's gonna be the bonding 1s first, then the anti-bonding 1s, and then the bonding 2s, anti-bonding 2s, et cetera, et cetera. So lower to higher energy is how this rules. Um, Pauli exclusion just means you can't have more than two electrons per molecular orbital. Hund's rule means you put each electron in its own orbital if they're the same energy, and you only start pairing it up if there's no more. We'll see this and stuff as we go through these examples. So this little video in shows that. In contrast valence bond theory, which assigns bonding orbitals to individual atoms, molecular orbital theory assigns the orbitals involved in bonding to the entire molecule. The simplest illustration of molecular orbital theory can be seen with the hydrogen molecule. According to molecular orbital theory, the 1s atomic orbitals of the two hydrogen atoms combine to give two molecular orbitals. Because atomic orbitals are wave functions, they can combine either constructively or destructively. Additive or constructive combination of the two atomic orbitals gives a bonding molecular orbital, while subtractive or destructive combination of the two atomic orbitals gives an anti-bonding molecular orbital. Bonding and anti-bonding molecular orbitals formed by the combination of two 1s orbitals are called sigma 1s and sigma star 1s respectively. Star is the anti. -bonding. The bonding molecular orbital sigma 1s is lower in energy than the original atomic orbitals, and the anti-bonding molecular orbital sigma star 1s is higher in energy than the original atomic orbitals. Like atomic orbitals, molecular orbitals can accommodate a maximum of two electrons each, with the electrons in the ground state occupying the lowest possible energy orbitals. The molecular orbitals in the hydrogen molecule can be represented with lines or boxes placed at the appropriate relative energy levels. The two electrons in the hydrogen molecule both occupy the bonding molecular orbital. Because most of the sigma 1s bonding molecular orbital is located between the two nuclei, electrons in this orbital draw the two nuclei together by electrostatic attraction. The sigma star 1s antibonding molecular orbital consists of two lobes. The majority of the space occupied by the two lobes does not lie between the two nuclei. In this molecular orbital, the region between the two lobes is known as a node. Electrons in this orbital would actually draw the two nuclei apart by electrostatic forces. Hydrogen has no electrons in this anti-bonding molecular orbital. In Chem 221, I made you memorize slash no slash put on your note sheet, whatever. Something like have no fear of ice clear group. All right, there's different versions of it, but the H have is for hydrogen, all right? This is finally a reason why H2 is H2, all right? Because you end up, when you make a molecular orbital for H2, the molecule, you end up with two electrons in the bonding sigma 1s. 
So normally hydrogen by itself is 1s1, so there's one electron in each of these boxes initially. When you make the H2 molecule, both of those electrons go to the sigma 1s bonding orbital. And that's an energy savings, all right? And if you can save money, cool. If you can save energy in science, cool. So that's why H2 loves to form, all right? You actually save some energy. H2 almost always is H2. It's not H atoms. If you're in a magnetic field or close to the sun, you might have individual hydrogens because it's able to not be too worried about this energy savings. But normally, H2 is H2 because of that reason. So. So this is the molecular orbital diagram, the part in the middle. We would say it was a sigma 1s2 because there's two electrons. Sigma star 1s is zero, so there wouldn't be anything in there. Every up arrow has a down arrow, diamagnetic, not attracted to magnetic fields. Hopefully you can start to see some of the advantages of Woohoo! Any questions? All right, we'll do more MO theory on Monday. All right, have a great day. I'll see most of you at 1:10 p.m. 2501.